Welcome back to our last review for an exam in Math 1030, Contemporary Mathematics for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be a professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Now, of course, when I say the last exam, I'm referring to exam four here. Uh, it's not a final exam. For Math 1030, we actually don't have a final exam, not a comprehensive final exam, at least in the traditional sense. This is the last exam, so do make a distinction there, the last exam versus the final exam. Uh, this exam will be very much in the same structure as the previous three exams we've seen this in this course. So there's probably not a lot of new information about the structure of the exam. Um, and as such, we're going to mostly focus on the topics that will be covered on the exam. Um, the only structural difference I can see, uh, I, should, I can mention here is the um, number of questions here. The multiple choice section will be a little bit longer on this exam. Each question will still be worth five points each, uh, but there's going to be twelve multiple choice section, uh, twelve multiple choice questions, thus making the multiple choice section uh, worth sixty points each. And then, as a consequence, the free response section will be a little bit shorter, only four questions there. So that gives us a grand total of sixteen questions on this exam. Uh, so this exam is going to cover the topics from lesson twenty nine all the way to the end. Uh, which is lesson 36. And so the main topics that you're going to see on this exam is the topics of probability and statistics. Okay. Uh, and so there's going to be some counting, there's going to be some probabilities, there's going to be some experimental design. And as such, you'll be expected to answer some of the questions related to these type of topics. So without further ado, let's talk about the specific types of things that you should be seeing on this exam. What should you be studying as you prepare for exam four? So let's begin with the multiple choice section as usual. So this very first question that you're going to see on the multiple choice is going to be something uh, taken directly from um, homework 29. So this is uh, in a lesson 29, we are introduced to the notions of sets. Uh, so things like set A, set B. In this context, we're just going to think of just as collections of numbers or objects and things like that. Our motivation for introducing sets is so that we could talk about sample spaces, events, um, that is, we use sets to calculate probabilities. Uh, but just, just from the notational perspective, I want us to understand the basic symbols that are involved with set theory. So if you're given some number of sets, so in this case, you're given two sets, maybe you're given three sets, probably not more than three. Um, I'm going to be asking you to do some calculations, like can you take the union of a set? Can you take the intersection of a set? Things like that. Can we find the complement of a set? So like, what's the intersection of a intersect B complement. Now, of course, if I give you uh, a complement, then we do need to describe what is the universe of the set that they're living in. Um, that's a possibility that could happen with complements come into play. So be prepared to do these basic calculations of sets, unions, intersections, complements. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to count the cardinality of the set. That is, remember this symbol here asks you to determine how many elements are in the set. Um, that makes it nice and easy for a multiple choice question. Uh, for as, when you compare these things together, you take the union. I don't need you to write the whole set. I just want to know how many elements are going to be in it. So if you think there's 12 elements, then you'd say the answer is C. Okay, so this will be similar to the type of things we did in lesson 29. And, and, and it's a company assignment there. Question number two. Um, this question could take on a couple different forms, but essentially what it's going to do is it's going to ask us to use the fundamental counting principle. Uh, the fundamental counting principle told us, remember, if we have independent events, then the product of the number of choices each event will tell us how many things we have together. So in this case, we have something like, okay, there's there's 25 students on one floor, 28 on another, 18 on another, 21 there. Um, how many different committees we can make? These are some various counting principles. Uh, counting principles uh, came up in lessons 30 and 31. Uh, with, you know, had to do with permutations and combinations and things like that. So question number two is going to be one of these counting principle type problems. I want us to understand and, and show our understanding of these counting techniques here. Uh, question number three is going to be a question about some probability, um, or I should say more statistics, because this is more of an enumeration question. Uh, so really the type of things we saw in lesson 34 is what I should say. 
Uh, that is, let's, we're gonna try to count the number of objects in some type of collection of some kind. So this could be like the one estimate sampling that we've talked about, the one estimate, uh, the, the one sample estimation, I should say, or like the two sample estimations. Can we predict like how large this thing is going to be? In this example, we have 200 coins, um, some are pennies, some are nickels. Uh, we take a handful and we have a sample. So can we guess then how many coins are in the jar? So using some sampling techniques to find proportions that then help us estimate the size of the population. This, these enumeration techniques are exactly what we did in lesson 34, and you should be prepared to do something like that. Question number four here, um, I really just want us to make sure we understand uh, the notation that's, a view, that's used in these counting problems. So things like permutations and combinations and factorials. Can you make a calculation or can you compute something involving these symbols? Uh, permutations, of course, were introduced in Lesson 30, combinations in 31. Uh, factorials have been, of course, throughout this entire unit. Uh, just be, be able to use, uh, to be able to understand these calculations and work through them. That's what I want to see with question number four. Fairly straightforward there. Uh, question number five is going to be a question about combinations. So as opposed to that previous question, which was just, I want to some see some just general counting. I'm not going to give you specific details. I can tell you that question number five is going to be specifically involving combinations of some kind. So you might want to go back to assignment 31 to see a little bit more about that if you need some extra practice. Uh, question number six is going to be a question about sampling. So some type of sampling is going to be described to you. So like a survey was conducted and it's going to tell you how the participants in the survey were sampled. What type of sampling is it? Is it cluster sampling, stratified, quota sampling, random sampling? Uh, I want you to be able to correctly identify the sampling technique that's used. And those were all defined in lesson 35. Let's move to the next page of the multiple choice section. Question number seven is going to be a question about permutations. So question five, we just had a uh, question about combinations. Remember, combinations are unordered list as opposed to permutations, which are ordered list. And we talked about those in lesson 30. There's lots of different types of permutations we can learn about. Uh, this question number seven could ask you any of them. So do make sure you feel comfortable uh, working with combinations and permutations and the other types of counting techniques that we've seen in those lessons. Uh, another example, of course, comes down to question number eight, uh, where we had things like the inclusion exclusion principle, which helps us be able to count unions of things because sometimes the events, the outcomes are not always mutually exclusive. I should say the events are not mutually exclusive. So how do you compute the the or the the cardinality of a union the basic principle is well the union's cardinality is the cardinality of the two events added together but then you have to subtract their intersection like so because you've counted the thing that that shows up in the middle twice so you have to cancel that thing out um, and so therefore with question number eight, think of it's like question number one, but a little bit more advanced. So you'll have things like unions and intersections, um, complements perhaps. And I wanted to see you be able to um, count the sets, probably a union using inclusion exclusion. Use, use these set techniques to try to evaluate what's the card now of the set, because when a probability is equally likely, the events I should say are equally likely, then computing the probability comes down to finding the cardinality of these sets. So computing cardinalities is a very important thing. We introduced that in lesson 29. I've used this throughout the entire unit. Be prepared to do something like that in question number eight. Uh, question number nine and 10 are gonna be some probability questions properly. Uh, so question number nine, you can expect that some type of probability is being described and I want you to find the probability of the event. Uh, so like the question you see on the screen right here, um, a student is guessing on a, on a math quiz, what's the probability that they're gonna ace the, the, the quiz if they just guess their way through it? So can we calculate the probability of a specific event? Um, question number 12 is going to have to do with probability models, right? Remember, a probability model is a function which takes on only non-negative values such that when you take the sum of all of the outcomes in the sample space, you end up with a probability of 1. That is 100%. So question number 10 is going to ask you, given some information about a potential probability function, uh, how do you finish the function in order to make it a probability model? So both of these topics, the probability of an event, uh, likewise the probability, a probability model, these were introduced in lesson 32. 
uh, which gave us all the all the principles of probability for which we then took the counting principles we learned about in the previous lessons 29 30 and 31 and then applied them to these probability models and thus we're able to calculate some probabilities of various outcomes and events all right uh, we haven't done too much about statistics yet other than like a sampling question i think um yeah so let, let's do some let's do more on the stat sides here i, I guess enumeration uh, I'm trying to do some sample proportions. That's a statistics question. But, okay, let, let, let's do some more statistics questions now. Question number 11 is going to be one of those statistics questions for which, again, a lot of it's going to come down to some vocabulary. When we learned about um, statistical design and how do you run a how do you run a clinical trial, there's a ton of vocabulary there that we have to be aware of. Question 11 is going to ask us about that. Uh, so, for example, question 11 here is going to describe a potential trial that can be conducted to collect data. Is this a single blind trial? Is it a double blind trial? Or maybe it's neither of those things. So do we understand the difference between these type of things? Um, also, if I describe a clinical trial, could we identify which of the groups is the control group? Which of the groups is the treatment group? What is the treatment itself? Um, so question 11 is going to test our understanding of the terminology with regard to clinical trials and statistical design. Uh, and so then that these are all terms that were introduced in lesson 36. You're going to want to know what those terms mean so that when asked, you can correctly identify, oh, this is a double blind trial or, or whatever it is. OK, then question number 12 is the last question, in the multiple choice section. This is going to be another question about computing the probability of an event. Uh, but this one's going to be a little bit more challenging than we saw on question nine. Question nine, the event will be fairly straightforward and just utilizes our understanding of probability. Question 12, though, is going to start to employ some of the counting techniques that we've been using to a probabilistic a situation so to a random variable so like in this situation if we have our standard deck of cards what's the probability that we'll draw certain cards right uh, so there's some counting principles come into play then you apply principles of probability and then you can calculate what's the probability of drawing a red card or a diamond something like that so or has to do with like unions so maybe inclusion exclusion comes into play there if uh, but maybe the events are independent. Uh, so number 12 definitely is a culmination of all of these principles we learned about with counting and with probability. And that'll be the last question in the multiple choice section. So let's move on to the free response, uh, which is much shorter this time because the or because the, the multiple choice section, because of the probability and statistics questions, is a little bit longer than usual. Uh, so question number 13. This one's only going to be worth eight points. Remember, all of the multiple choice questions were worth five. 12 times five gave you 60 points there. Uh, question number 13 is an eight point uh, free response question for which some type of random variable is going to be described to you. Like in this case, we have a spinner board um, with four different colors. And so if we were to spin uh, the arrow twice, what is the possible sample space there? And so question number three. Uh, 13 here, I want you to describe the sample space of some type of um, random variable that will be described. And so you would write it as a set. So this would be something like, oh, the sample space would be like green, green. The sample, it would also include green, blue. You know, you'd actually write it out. What are all of the possible outcomes of this random variable that's described here? So this, of course, was introduced to us in section 32. So feel free to go back to that lesson if you need some more uh, practice. And of course, the company assignment as well. Uh, question number 14. This is going to be a question, and this is their last question from the probability chapter here. Uh, this is going to be a question about expected value. So in this question, you're going to have some random variable explained to you. This particular one has to do with some street vendor playing some type of marble game. Um, and you can win some money by drawing marbles out of a jar, things like that. So there's just a it's, a, it's a random variable, and you're ex expected to compute the expected value of that random variable. This is the entire topic that was covered in lesson 33, and honestly, nothing from lesson 33 has been um, described thus far. So by all means, question number 14, which is worth 10 points, will give you an opportunity to compute the expected value of a uh, random variable. So the expected value is kind of like the average, the mean. It tells you what should you expect. If you were to play this game over and over again on average, what would you expect to be your winnings from playing such a game? 
All right, so now we're to the last page of this exam. We're blowing through this one right faster than we usually do. But again, we, we understand how these exams work. We just need to know about what are the topics, what are the types of questions we're going to be asked here so we can get through this a lot faster. And we're, we're doing pretty good. We're in a much better place this time of the semester than we probably were much earlier. Uh, questions 15 and 16 will both be about statistics, um, kind of formatted in a similar way to the multiple choice question that we saw earlier, for which you're going to be described some type of clinical trial. Uh, so we have things about some smell and taste treatment. How does that work out? Um, how does aspirin, you know, when people take aspirin, how does that affect things? So you're describing some type of statistical study, and then you have to make some analysis of it. So like, can you... And number 15, can you describe who the target population is for this study and who is the sample for the study? Uh, again, put this in words. So you would actually like write out a, a sentence or two to answer these questions or in this case, describe them. Um, could you describe like uh, I could ask about the placebo effect. So in words, you would describe um, how would the placebo effect manifest itself in this situation. Question number 16, kind of similar. Um, you're describing some type of clinical trial, and then it's like, identify any count confounding variables that could interfere with the study. Um, could you describe any type of sampling bias that might exist in the study there? So question 15 is gonna focus more on the mechanical sides of the statistics, like what's the anatomy of the statistics? What's the what's the population, the target population? What's the sample? Um, how is the how has the study been framed? What's the placebo? Um, is you know who's the control group? Who's the who's the treatment group? That type of stuff. Again, really much. Question fifteen is going to ask about the anatomy of your statistical uh, study there. While sixteen is then going to look at the limitations of that study. Well, that's what we're going to talk about, like what variables did we not control for? Are there any biases inside of that? Like, again, exploring the limitations of these statistical studies. All right, both of these questions, 15 and 16, are worth 10 points. And, and unlike the previous questions, I'm not expecting a calculation of any kind. I'm actually expecting um, a writing sample from you. So you would write the answer. Again, a you know, couple sentences, a small paragraph should be able to answer these things. And do make sure that you thoroughly answer the questions with regard uh, to these statistical design questions. All right, then. So that gets us to question number 16, and which is the last question on this exam. Uh, and this is the last exam for the semester, so fantastic for making it this far. Um, if you do have any questions for exam four that haven't already been answered in this video, I would encourage you, one, take a look at the exam syllabus as there's a lot of useful information there that, of course, is pertinent for this exam. Look at the other study resources that you can find on Canvas, such as the practice exam. That could be very helpful. But most importantly, if you do have any questions, please reach out to me. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. Um, work together with your classmates. And also remember, just endure to the end, right? You know, we're, we're near the end of the term, and this is one of our last chances to get a good mark in the grade book that has a significant weight on our final grade. I know you can do it. It's our last exam, but this is not necessarily the hardest one. Uh, it really comes down to some of these counting principles and understanding the strengths and limitations of statistical research. If you understand those things, you're going to do just fine on this test. And if you don't, we'll get some help and you'll get there. Everyone I can trust can do super fantastic on this exam. Best of luck.